who's with us here. And uh, we have uh, a representative from the city of Greater Sudbury who's going to be talking about the voting process too. I'm John Lindsay, I'm the uh, vice chair and that's why I'm up here doing the duties today that Hugh normally does. Uh, we uh, want to mention just a few things before we get underway. Uh, rather sad note we want to mention and uh, that uh, for many, many years, uh, a dear, dear friend of ours, of course, and uh, many of you know, Millie Faka, who passed away, and she was here for, as I said, many, many years giving out the 50-50 tickets uh, with her husband, Primo. And uh, Millie passed away, and she was born in 1927. She had a great life, a great contributor to the community, and Millie's certainly going to be missed. We're going to miss her very much. On a happier note, our CARP travel coordinator, Irene Shekettle, advises there's a trip planned for Montreal in May, and we have a representative uh, from our travel agency at the back and signing up people for the Montreal trip. The trip to Jamaica has been sold out, but uh, we're taking names in case anyone's thinking about getting away to a warmer climate this fall. And also, uh, Come From Away, uh, which is the fantastic musical on the, the gander rescue, you might say, of the 6,500 passengers who ended up in Gander, Newfoundland at 9-11. And uh, that musical has been, that trip has also been sold out, but we're taking uh, names again for that. And uh, at the back table afterwards, if you'd like, you can uh, check out the travel opportunities. And uh, I don't know how many of you attended Cinefest, but um, they had a film on the Gander uh, adventure, you might call it. And uh, very good, and watch for that. It's coming up probably on Netflix or the movie channel or something, but it's, uh, it's well worth. I think it's called You Are Here. <laughs> a lot of, did anybody see that film? Yeah, uh, yeah. Map of Canada. No, they didn't know where they were. No, they didn't know where they were. They, and uh, <laughs> I lived in Newfoundland for a number of years. I didn't know where I was either, but, <laughs> but uh, just down the road from Gander. But um, we have a special opportunity for those of you who may be over 80. You don't have to hold up your hands. But if you're over 80, there's a special survey being taken. It's uh, being done by Laurentian University. And they're, they're checking people who are with people who are over 80. It's just about an hour uh, interview. And they want to find out what people over 80, how they feel about, well, you know, life in general, uh, what the concerns they might have, and it's going to be uh, a special report. So if you are, as it says here, if you are older, senior, 80 plus, and live in Sudbury, you're invited to participate in this study. And if you participate, you get a $25 Tim Hortons gift certificate. So you have to be over 80, though. That's, uh, that's, that, that is, and I know that no one here is over 80, so I don't know why I'm bothering that, but nevertheless. Uh, although I did get my Tim certificate. <laughs> Some disclosure there. <laughs> By the way, we'll be, CARP will be holding an all-candidates meeting on October the 11th. And that, that's for the candidates for mayor, that is. And that'll be at the Older Adult Center. And probably the last chance to evaluate the candidates for mayor. There's a meeting last night held by Livable Sudbury at St. Andrew's Place, pretty well attended. Uh, most of the candidates were there. And we're hoping that most of the candidates will be coming out to this meeting on October the 11th. So it's going to be a little different. What we have given to the candidates is the results of the survey that a lot of you took part in at our annual general meeting. And those questions that we asked, we have uh, sort of summarized them into a number of questions. I'll just go through just a couple of them here. And uh, we've given the questions or our survey results to the candidates and we've asked them to answer in about five minutes because there's so many candidates. It depends how many show up, we may stretch that five minutes, but we wanted to, basically for them to answer what they feel about these particular concerns that have been expressed in the survey that we did and see what their response is and we'll have a social period afterwards you have a chance to meet with the various candidates. 
So some of the questions were, or the responses were, 88% said they wanted municipal taxes kept to the rate of inflation or less. 84% uh, <laughs> felt that present streets and roads should be repaired and maintained before any new construction takes place. With regards to a casino, 35% wanted to see a new facility, while 27% favored expansion of the Chelmsford Slots location, and 39% did not want any expanded gambling in the city whatsoever. 94% felt there should be a limit on development in the Lake Ramsey watershed to protect Lake Ramsey from growing salt contamination. And with respect to changing the city structure through de-amalgamation, 59% felt this should take place, while well, 41% said no. So these were the results of the, of the survey. And the other question we were putting to the candidates is that maybe the age limit for parking downtown should be reduced to the former 60 or 65 or even 55. And for the Parkside Older Adult Center, and many retirees use that facility and many are on a fixed income, and who use that facility regularly and the parking costs could be, well, we know that the membership did drop when they reduced the age for the reduction in the parking fees. And someone suggested, and we put this in here, saying that if the older adult center had been built anywhere else in the city, there probably would have been a free parking. So why isn't there free parking at the older adult center downtown? So those are some of the questions that are being put to the candidates that they have already been sent to the candidates, and we hope that they're going to be respond on that October the 11th, 6.30, the Older Adult Center, and we hope to have coffee and tea available too, and maybe some other goodies. So the candidates will have a chance to talk. They're, they're given their few minutes, and then uh, we'll have a chance to sort of meet and greet afterwards. So we hope you can come out to that. And I think that's about it before we get underway here with our actual agenda, and Sandra Dujardin, who is our loyal secretary, uh, will help me out with the agenda. I think most of you have a copy of the agenda that was circulated. And uh, so, the motion to accept the agenda, and so just call out your name, and uh, who, who's, who's taking the minutes, by the way, today? Sandra, are you taking the minutes? Okay. And uh, just before we get underway, Keith, Keith Argent, who's uh, on our board as well, too, with our other folks, uh, I just want Keith just to come up here just for a second. Just to clear things up. By the way, I just want to introduce our board of directors. It is Hugh, of course, who's our president. Uh, Ken Desjardins is our treasurer. Sandra Desjardins is our secretary. And our directors, Keith, who's coming up here. That's what I do. Marianne, uh, Irene Schickettle, Joe Werta, Lizette Werta, and uh, Sue Lebeck. Those are our members of the executive. But I, th I think I just brought you up here just because I know a lot of people ask me this, and just before we get underway, people talk about the membership and they're sort of, they're concerned. Now there has been some changes in the membership, and maybe you could sort of explain that briefly as to how it works out. Okay, all our membership now is through uh, CARP National, and you can uh, go online and you apply there. That's the best way, it's the quickest. We're going to try to get it uh, fixed up so we have some brochures here. We, it'll be all manual, so it'll be a little longer. Uh, she's got some back there now if you need to fill it in, but the best way is online. It's a lot quicker, a lot faster. If you're not getting any email, it's because either your membership's up due or your information's incorrect, and I can get that fixed for you. But uh, uh, Carp International are taking care of all the membership enrollments, and they do it all themselves, and then we get a list of who's the member and all the email addresses and stuff like that. But if you're having trouble with membership, just send us a, an email, if you can, or call us, and we'll get it fixed up for you. All right. There's one back there now. Send it. Okay. So anyway, so just uh, fill out at the at the table at the back, and Sandra will mail it out. Great. Thanks very much, Keith. And Sandra's coming up in a moment to talk about the uh, the ultimate dream home. So do we have a motion to? So you're all members. You're all here. We hope you're all members. Most of you. Okay. Great. A motion to accept the agenda today. Lisa. Oh, do we have a seconder? Oh, uh, Sandra? <laughs> Are you? I hear this little voice from the way back in. What was Lisa's last name? Toner Lindsay. Toner Lindsay. 
And we have a seconder. Adrian Demore is a seconder. Okay, motion to accept the minutes. Oh, all in favor? Yeah, okay, we're all in favor. Motion to accept the minutes of the March 22nd, 2018 meeting. So we have a motion to Jack DeCorby. I can tell his hand went up back there. Thank you. I can see that far. Uh, my cataracts haven't affected me. Marianne. Oh, Marianne, yes, sorry, you're right here. Marianne seconded, and we're all set. The financial report, well, those of you who have a copy of the agenda, you can see our financial report. Uh, thanks to Ken Desjardins, who is our secretary. And it looks like, according to the financial report, that we are still in business. Some people wonder, okay, uh, where does our money come from? Well, we get a certain amount of money from the national headquarters for people who sign up for CARP membership. We get a small amount back, and also we earn a certain amount of money from our participation in selling tickets for the Ultimate Dream Home for the, for the Heart of Hearing. And Sandra will talk about that uh, in just a very few minutes. So a motion to accept. Is there anybody questions about the financial report, which I won't be able to answer? That's very good, thank you. Motion to accept the financial report. Some brave soul. Just hold up your hand and from the back there, and you are? My name is Uganda. And a seconder. For seconder, I, I see a seconder back there. Are you looking at me or are you I'm looking, yeah. Iris is, Iris Unsworth is the seconder. Okay. So, we have reached the ultimate dream home, which as you know, are tickets available coming up at uh, $20 a piece, I think. Right, four books of five, for so on. Sandra, get down here and explain all this. And we're looking for volunteers, of course, to, uh, and it's a, it's a fun experience because I take part in it every year and as do most of our members of our board. We have a chance to be at the Ultimate Dream Home and uh, you know, meet a lot of interesting people that come in and uh, buying tickets. So it's, a, it's sort of a fun thing to do, right? Right. Okay, we have the Ultimate Dream Home, as you see on the new sheets, okay? I changed one week because well, because my husband and I are going to be away and I didn't want to put it on someone else to have to do. So Monday, October 29th to Sunday, November the 4th. You should be looking at the new sheet. Not the old sheet. The old sheet said the 17th to the... No, the home. It is supposed to be Sunday, November the 25th. Not Saturday. That was a... Okay, so we have the Altered Dream Home for three days in October, the 12th, 13th, and 14th. The 13th and 14th are mostly filled. I need a couple more people. Um, and uh, the 12th, they may not be open, so I'm not going to get anybody until the last minute for that one. But if you can do it, maybe you can just let me know so I'll know to call you if you can do it. And then we have the... the um, the kiosk on October 29th to September to Sunday, November the 4th. There are lots of different shifts. Sundays are shorter, of course. They're only three hours each. Uh, the rest are four and five hours. Um, Irene has decided to retire this year, so my husband and I are in charge of this this year. I've already got some volunteers, but if you can volunteer, I'd love to have you. It is lots of fun. You get to meet other CART members, plus you get to meet all the people who come in. So it's really interesting. Then we have the house again for a full week, Monday, November 19th to Sunday, November the 25th. There are the two shifts, 9 to 1 and 1 to 6. We need seven people for each shift this year because the, the stairs are going up and going down right at the front doors. And they're letting us in the front doors, not through the garage this time. So we need someone to stand there and make sure nobody falls down the stairs. So there'll be signs all over the place that say, be very careful, she'll give you a bag to put your shoes in. 
or the people who are coming, she'll give you, they give them a bag to put their shoes in, and they carry their shoes with them through the, through the house. We're not going to leave them because people got their shoes stolen last year from leaving them in the garage. So we're going to uh, make sure it doesn't happen this year. Um, but we need somebody at the door to make sure no one falls downstairs. So that's why they're going to be there. Uh, that's the extra person. The other, the other six will be doing what they normally do. I'll be the team leader for the first weekend, for sure, and probably most of the weekends. Um, so then I'll need the five other people who do the, how, do the debit machine, the phone, and the, four, the three that are upstairs kind of making sure, or sitting in the kitchen selling tickets, and one that makes sure no one sits on the beds or goes in the shower or whatever they, whatever they want to do, you know. <laughs> And then we have the uh, new Subbury Centre kiosk. That's what NSC means, new Subbury Centre kiosk, from, um, again, on uh, Monday, December 3rd to December 9th, which is great because last year we had the week after Christmas, so this year we're not even close to Christmas. So it should be easier to fill, I hope. Um, again, lots of shifts, lots of, chi lots of different ones you can pick if you want to help out. That would be great. And... Uh, I don't think I left my phone number on there, but if you have a pen, job it down, 969-1777. But I have all, probably all your phone numbers, so I'll be calling you. <laughs> a lot of people. 969-1777. Yes. So. And this, you have to remember, this is really our only fundraiser. Last year we made $5,600 or something, which was pretty good. This year, we've only got three full weeks and then three days. And they might not even be three days because we don't know if it'll be open the 12th. And Keith was saying it might not be open at all that weekend, so we might lose the whole weekend, which will be a drag. But so we got we to gotta make sure we have people for all of it or we don't get to do the house next year. So let's make sure we have volunteers for everything so we can do it. And the kiosk. Kiosk only requires two people, but one has to know how to use the, the debit machine. So you can pair up with a friend if you want and tell me what days you can do or time, times you can do, but one of you needs to know how to use the debit machine, okay? Because there'll be a debit machine at the kiosk. Sure. And you just sit there, one of you goes for lunch, if you happen to be working over the lunch period, and the other one stays. You never leave the booth alone never, with nobody there. You have to, one person has to stay all the time. So take turns going to the washroom, having lunch, whatever, going to get snacks or whatever you want. Um, it, it can be fun too. I've worked at the, the mall as well. Me too. It's yeah. good. It's good. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's lots of fun. It's a beautiful kiosk they built. So <laughs> Solid lots, oak. Lots of room in there. Okay, so I hope to hear from uh, anyone who'd like to help out. I'll be sitting at the back there. If you come over, I have all the sheets with all the dates on them, if you just want to give me a time and date, it'll just fill you in right away. And uh, if you want to wait and phone me, that will be fine too. Okay? Thank you very much. That's interesting. Let's hear it for Sandra. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah, thank you, thank you. We, our organization couldn't exist without Sandra, you know, a secretary who keeps us all in line, who is responsible for all the details and that sort of thing, and uh, it's, it's great to have her, and the rest of the board is... is, is it's really fantastic. We we we, uh, whoops, we have a good time. I'm throwing things around here. Okay, time to get on with the show. And uh, Mr. Price is fixing me up here. Mr. Price is a fixer-upper. Uh, I'm supposed to do a Tom Price introduction here. It says on my little notes here, and I and I lost my introduction sheet, so I'm going to have to sort of wing it a little bit here. But uh, it's, uh, known as a project manager. Is that the correct terminology? He's, he's, done, he's done work for INCO. He worked for INCO for a number of years. He's traveled around the world. He's worked uh, on many different types of projects. Uh, the project manager is the person who puts everything together and is responsible for the final outcome. They have to know basically everything. And uh, Tom knows a lot about everything. Some of us know a little bit about a lot of things, but Tom knows a lot about a lot of things, and uh, and he's a real gem, and uh, we're very happy to have him here today. Now, this is going to be a shortened uh, version of his regular presentation, but for those of you who are interested and, uh, you know, your interest is aroused a bit by today's presentation with Tom, you have a chance to see the whole presentation is taking place on Thursday, October the 4th, 
It's coming up at 1.30 at the Lexington. And uh, you're invited to come along. And uh, this is just a sample of some of the, just a, a, a teaser, really, for, for the whole presentation, which Tom will be going into. The presentation in one form has already been on the internet for a while, but he's revised it to a certain extent. And I think you're going to find it very interesting. So, uh, Tom, have I covered most of the introduction properly? Is there anything else? I, uh, did I leave okay. anything out? Uh, and uh, we'll have a chance for some questions and answers, and we'll be inviting April up from the city, who will be talking about the new procedures for voting. Uh, but don't forget about the, the dream home. I'm a little wondering about this, uh, <laughs> you know, getting into the dream home and watching all uh, this. Uh, is this home going to be really friendly senior? Friendly to seniors? Uh, it seems like all the homes that are built now all have all these stairs in them for some reason. Ah, okay, Sandra, you're worried. You're worried about that. Am I okay? Okay, just stick to the agenda here. The chair's report. We don't have a chair's report because Hugh is over there drinking wine in England somewhere or wherever. So we don't have to have a, a motion to accept the chair's report. And uh, because I'm the vice chair, but I don't have a report, so that's it. And you're glad to see me go. And welcome. Tom Price. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, just before I get into the presentation, uh, since this council was formed four years ago, uh, every time I've brought forward something that disagreed with them, I have been criticized as not knowing anything. That I wasn't an engineer, therefore I qualified to comment on anything. And this has been rampant uh, from Millie Drive and right up to, to now. Uh, the presentation that's on YouTube, they came back with two pages of questions uh, alluding to the fact that I may be in error in my presentation. Okay, So I would like to first of all just take a couple minutes to let you know what my credentials are. In my time at INCO, in 1974, I was made responsible, oh I'm sorry, I don't want to cut John off on his recording, there. I was made responsible for pulling together a report on sulfur dioxide abatement. I pulled together that report, uh, it's too bad Floyd Logren isn't here because he acquired a copy of that report and presented it in the provincial legislature at the time. That report identified $300 million worth of work. Today's dollars, that would be $1.5 billion. Most of the work that was con is contained in this report has been built since then. There's been two flash furnaces. There was one in this. There's been an oxygen plant. It was in here. There's been an acid plant. It was in here. There's been work on capturing converter gas. That has just been completed this year. At that time, INCO had enough trust in me to give me this job. As well, in 1976, INCO embarked on a project just outside of Pittsburgh to recycle chromium and nickel from stainless steel. I have here with me the pilot plant report that we used, and I was the design leader, leader to convert that pilot plant work into a full-scale operating nickel chromium recovery plant from stainless. That process is identical to the chromite smelter that the city was promoting for Coniston. I have done the work. That, chromi or that chrome nickel plant in Pittsburgh or outside of Pittsburgh has been cloned several times around the world. They are all still operating, and the one in Pit outside of Pittsburgh has been expanded to include recover of cadmium. When the major projects came up, Councilor Vagnini in Ward 2 asked me what my opinion was on the large projects. I prepared a report that I presented to him on the large projects. There were 16 of them. The current four that they are pursuing never even fell in the top 10. 
council chose to exclude all except these four. Only though, after council voted on the large projects and there were five projects identified. The fifth one was a light rail transit system for the city to bring people from the outlying areas to downtown. When that came up in the council meeting, they decided they weren't going to go with five, they cut it off and they only went with four. That one that they cut off had the highest value to the community of any of the projects because it builds our community. They chose to exclude it. So that's a bit of my background. I will now get into the presentation for you. Everything that you're going to see today and next Thursday, I have backup for. Any time that I tell you about inflation, about uh, any of these factors, including all the budget information, all of the budget numbers come directly off the city budget sheets. There are none made up, there are none adjusted. They are all direct numbers. Okay? So at that point, I'll move on. The first issue, of course, is what, it, what message am I trying to tell you? Well, the message I'm trying to tell you is that the Municipal Act defines very, very precisely the role of council and the role of the mayor. And the role of council to represent the public and to consider well-being and interests of the municipality, in my opinion, they have failed miserably at, and you'll see that as we go through. Second one, to develop and evaluate policies and programs of the municipality. They allowed the city just recently to develop a code of conduct for council. That is not the city's job. That is council's job working with outside sources. So council failed in that. Now that's been deferred till January for the new council. To determine which services the municipality provides. D1, to ensure accountability and transparency. I don't know about any of you, but I have trouble finding any accountability at the city. To maintain financial integrity, and by the time you get done here this afternoon, you'll see that that does not exist. The role of the mayor. The overriding role of the mayor is very clearly defined as being without limiting other clauses to provide information recommendations to council with respect to the role of council. Our current mayor goes well beyond that. And to preside over council meetings so this business can be carried out efficiently and effectively. Anyone who was at or saw the live screen viewing of Tuesday night's council meeting will realize that that did not happen at all. In fact, I was concerned today coming here after the chicken fiasco in council and John conveniently provided me a deflector, so anybody who wanted to throw eggs, you're going to have to get past that post. <laughs> so, my point here today is be very careful which counselors you send to council. Counselor's job is to decide how the city runs. They are like a board of directors. They decide the direction the city takes, not the mayor and not the city. The mayor's job is to take direction from council and make sure that it happens within the city. That is not how it's been running for the last four years, in fact, for the last eight years. Okay? So that's the message, and I put this up front because I may run out of time in what I'm doing today, and I wanted to make sure that everyone had that message. So where has council taken us? Well, they're taking us back for our future. And this sign, General, Su General Soup Kitchen 1880, is where we're headed. And if you think I'm over-dramatizing on that, hold off your thoughts for just a few minutes. What this council has done, they've focused on soup kitchens, food banks, homeless assistance, seniors' homes, drug kitchens, thrift shops, community gardens, and that's what they see as building our community. I haven't, in all of the four years 
seen any council debates on rebuilding our economy. And our economy depends on a balance of trade. We need companies in this city who can sell their product outside of the city for more money than what we have to pay for things coming into our city. That's how you increase the wealth in the city. There has been no proposals that I'm aware of to bring in companies like that. That is a shame. This council has not had one debate that I am aware of, and I've attended almost every council meeting, on how to bring a company in here that can increase our wealth. And in fact, some of the companies that are already here in endeavoring to increase our wealth have had roadblocks put in their way along the road to try to prevent them from doing that. As a community, we cannot tolerate that. We need counselors who can see the future with us and help build towards that future. In addition, down at the bottom here, for those who can't see at the back, for the first time, at least as far as I'm aware, for the first time in the history of Sudbury, council has asked the city to develop a means test to determine who's poor enough to qualify for social assistance. That's a sad commentary on our economy. The second thing they've done is they've concentrated on distractions to keep us away from the real problems we're facing. What distractions am I talking about? Well, we're all aware of the biggest one. The biggest one's the Arena Event Center. Why do I say it's a distraction? Well, in 2013, the previous council was negotiating with OLG towards having the casino provider also include in their proposal a OHL ready arena at their cost, no cost to Sudbury taxpayers. Okay. With the new council in 2015, they hired, I believe, a CBRE consultants to do a study on the existing arena versus a new arena. That consultant came back with a report that said it would take $12 million to fix up our existing barn to a really good condition with appropriate change rooms, appropriate washrooms, uh, concession stands, the whole bit. If we wanted to expand the capability of the existing arena, it would cost us $50 million. And if we wanted to build a new arena, it would cost $65 million. That report was presented to Council in 2015. In 2016, instead of addressing any of those, instead of having any votes or debate on those, they moved ahead with the large projects. And the large projects, one of those projects, was a new arena at $60 million. They hired another consultant, PricewaterhouseCooper, to take a look at that. PricewaterhouseCooper identified a new arena event center at $80 million, and in their presentation of that, they stated unequivocally that Sudbury, to council, that Sudbury should not be contemplating an arena event center similar to London because we did not have and do not have the demographics to support that. However, council didn't listen. We've now gone on and we now have an arena event center now priced at $100 million funded by us, the taxpayers. And that's what everybody talks about is $100 million. But in the 2017 business case for that, there's a pre-spending ahead of the $100 million of $4 million. So it's actually $104 million coming out of our pockets. In addition to that, the $100 million won't be borrowed until 2022. With the escalation forecast of, of Stats Canada and the Bank of Canada, that $104 million will go to $119 million. If that got borrowed today at today's interest rates of 4.7, that's prime rate plus one, that Arena Event Center will cost Sudburyans $233 million, 200, sorry, $222 million before it's done. 
That is a total distraction, but it's only one of four. I won't enlarge on that anymore. I'll move on to the next item. But if you come to the presentation at the Lexington next week, you will be able to see all of them. I'm sure many of you have seen this list of 40 items. I won't go through each one of them. Uh, there is a handout at the end of the meeting. I have 50 copies uh, of that sheet, as well as the next two, three sheets. Uh, inflation over the last four years has increased by 5.9%. Every cost figure that affects us taxpayers have increased by over 12%, more than doubled the rate of inflation. They have argued with that. They have gotten back and said, well, that isn't the inflation rate for municipalities, and that isn't the cost in the index for construction. Yeah, I'm well aware of that. I've used cost index for construction from RS Means, which is the world leader in predicting and recording costs for construction for years. This isn't relation to what their costs grow by. This is in relation to what our incomes increase by. Because we're governed by the rate of inflation on consumer index, not the construction index, not the municipal index. So if our incomes have only gone up by less than 6% and city costs have gone up by over 12%, guess what's happening to us? We're getting shafted. Pure and simple, okay? That's the second part of that same sheet, and as I say, both of these sheets are included in the handout at the end, so I won't enlarge on that. Uh, the next one, this dem demonstrates very graphically what has been happening. The blue line and the blue bars are inflation, consumer inflation. This is how much our wages, how much our pensions, how much everything to do with us consumers have been going up. The red bar is the property tax increases over those same four years. As you can see, it's double. In, in fact, the budget increase has been just under 12%. The reason for the difference between property tax and budget increase is we've been getting a little bit more money from the province. This is a very, very critical graph, okay? This is the population distribution in Sudbury based on age. Every vertical line is a five-year increment in age. In 2011, Census Canada did the census and established these age groups. At that time, that circle there, is the 40-year-old to 65-year-old portion of our population. That is the highest income earning age group in the city, in fact, in the, in the country. Uh, up to then, you're at minimum wage, or be, when you get out of minimum wage, you're at minimal wage as you develop into your job expertise. You don't reach full income peak until you're in your 40s or 50s, okay? So at that time, we had an income vacuum as shown there in the blue up in the center. At that time, the zero to 20 year olds were that blue box on the left, and this group, the 65 to 85s, were the blue box on the right, okay? They redid the census in 2016. That income gap increased according to what you see in green. The population of 0 to 20 year olds dropped. The populations of 65 to 85 year olds grew. By 2020, if you extrapolate the numbers from Stats Canada, this is what we'll be facing. That income vacuum will grow. There's no new younger people following in. If you, if you look at this, That's level. There's no people in that 40, going to be in that 40 to 65 year old group that's going to be pay, able to pay those high taxes or those uh, disposable incomes, okay? In addition to that, 
the group under 20 shrinks even more. Based on that, this council should have been addressing how do we get high income jobs into this city. We're going to be going bankrupt if we don't. And that is just a simple fact. It's not supposition, it's not my opinion. That is a fact. As well, the 65 to 85 year olds have now grown, will have grown up to there and many of those will be on either limited pensions, they will be on index pensions and just because people talk about index pensions, I worked at INCO for many, many years. I have an INCO pension. My index pension to inflation in the last year amounted to 0.7 percent. That doesn't even come close to the city growth in spending. So that's where we're headed population-wise. If we don't get councillors going back in this election that are prepared to address that problem and tackle it head on, we don't need more debates about sport events. We don't need more debates about arts and entertainment. We don't need any of the wants that everybody loves. We need to be addressing our needs. Where the heck are we going to get the money? All of this comes out of the city budget and I'll just When it comes to the city budgets, we get one of these sheets every year in the city budget. Okay? The numbers under 2017 budget, this is the 2018 budget, and what they do is they tell you that oh, well, it's only increasing by three and a half percent. Okay? Well, that's down at the bottom, or 3.8 percent. However, that's in comparison to an adjusted budget, not the budget. The budget for 2017 was 288 million, not 291 million. If you're comparing budget year to budget year, you would expect to see that in comparison to the budget. Yes, there's adjustments to budgets that get approved and everything else over the year, but those are known as variances. We did not meet the 2017 budget. It's that simple. So if we move down the chart, whoop, sorry about that. Our expenses for 2017 were budgeted apparently with an adjusted budget at 541 million. That isn't the budget that was in the 2017 budget. Those expenses have been increased and it shows in this year 2018 budget at 541 but what was in the 2017 budget was 537. So they spent 4 million more. However, that's not the end of the story. In this 2018 budget, they also presented what the projected actuals for 2017 were. Those actuals were projected at this number here, $553 million. So if you take a look at the revenues that were supposed to have been uh, $301 million, Actually, the 2017 budget said 288 million, so the city actually got two million, twelve million dollars more in revenue than what the budget was. At the same time, the 2017 actual was 554 million, the budget was 537, so they actually overran the 2017 budget by 16.6 .6 million dollars. Uh, and I, I would just ask a show of hands, how many people here knew the Avon overran? You did? Wow, we got one. <laughs> yes, 17, close to 17 million dollars overrun. This is good fiscal management, uh, not in my books. Anyhow, moving on, this is the city budget sheet, okay? Uh, 
Okay. These, this sheet, you will have the handout of this sheet, okay? This compares every budget from 2014 to 2018, and it also shows the variance on the right between 2014 and 2018, how much it's increased. Those numbers are directly off their budget sheets. I haven't made up anything. The next one is the 2014 to 2018 comparison for expenses. Again, those numbers are directly off their budget sheets. They're not the adjusted budgets, they're the budgets we were given in that year, and then the next year, then the next year. Earlier this year, we were told by Mayor Bigger that Standard & Poor's has given us a double A credit rating so we can borrow money. What he didn't tell you was how they established that credit rating. And any credit rating is dependent on your ability to pay back the money. The two, and, and I'll enlarge that, The two key reasons that Standard & Poor's gave was that the city, first of all, Sudbury's proven its ability to increase taxes to match operating needs. Isn't that great? If they want to spend more money, all they have to do is increase our taxes. And Standard & Poor's says, yay, they can repay us our loan. The second was approximately 80% of Sudbury's operating revenue are internally modifiable, primarily from taxes, fees, and user fees. So if property taxes get too high, we can keep them where they are, and we'll simply charge higher user fees. And we've all seen that happening. And John's getting impatient with me, so. <laughs> no, I'm not impatient, really. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> impatient used to be my middle name, they said. Or is impotent, I'm not, anyway. Uh, so Tom, thank you very much. Now it's time for some questions and answers we hope from Tom and don't forget for the whole presentation and it's going to be at the Lexington and it will be in the afternoon in one of the dark rooms so you have a chance to see the screen even better but for those before we ask April to come up to talk about the uh, new method of voting here in town uh, any questions for Tom and we have a couple of minutes for Tom if you have any questions on uh, his presentation and uh, as we mentioned also, you'll be at the Lexington on October 4th for more revelations. And you know what this whole thing sort of brought up to me is the old, the old uh, musical line from, uh, from the sound of, uh, what was that? Uh, we got trouble right here in River City? That's, that's, that's from the Music Man, right? Anybody, anybody remember that? We got trouble right here in Sunbury City. No, no, it's uh, the Music Man, I think. Is the Music Man, is that where it's from? The Music Man, okay, great, thank you. Robert Preston. Robert Preston did that, yeah. We got trouble, 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 right here. Okay, Tom, any questions, folks? Yes. And, uh, and, and Tom's gonna repeat the questions for you. I just have a comment, if you wanna dig further and see why this is happening to Sudbury and many other cities, both in Canada and globally, look up neoliberalism and look at the delve into that now. I can't repeat all that because I'll have to wait for my long-term memory to kick in. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, did anybody not hear her? Okay. Oh, it's okay. You don't need to know. You're a counselor. <laughs> Any other questions? <laughs> yes.
Absolutely. Along that same line, uh, in 2015, we were led to believe that we had a 0% tax increase. That is true. In fact, it was minus 0.9% over the previous year. What we weren't told is that all of the money for that zero tax increase came out of reserves and since then has had to be paid back by increased taxes. It also increased our user fees and those have not dropped back. So I'm not going to say anybody lied, but certainly there was a lot of... Uh, how many are familiar with the shell game? Well, anyhow, any other questions? Okay, well, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, there is a lot more to this, and I hope to see those of you who are interested coming out next Thursday, and you can see the balance of the presentation, and I have to warn you, it doesn't get any better. <laughs> okay, and again, I thank you for your attention and for inviting me. Thank you very much, Tom. Our presentation, like all our, all our events, all our meetings are recorded and we put them on our, we put them on our website. Uh, I'm just wondering, uh, how many are on the fixed income here? How, how many, uh, well, uh, pretty, much, pretty much everybody? Uh, uh, do you still have some people here who are still working? Hey, great. Yes. How come you're not at work? <laughs> you're not even a senior. <laughs> By the way, all our meetings are open to everybody. You don't have to be a senior to attend our meetings. I want to thank uh, Megan, who's, uh, who's running the camera back here. She's an intern for the Sudbury Arts Council, is working uh, out of my office uh, for the next year or so. And uh, April, come on down. So uh, it's a new system, or it's sort of a new system this year <coughs> with respect to uh, voting. And you know that of any demographic group, seniors vote the most. Now, I guess that's because, you know, from the time we were of voting age, we were told that it was our civic responsibility, it was, a, you know, a duty to vote. If we didn't vote, we weren't supporting democracy. And if we didn't vote, we wouldn't have supper that evening. Uh, so uh, basically, most of us have always uh, voted. Some of us have been foolish enough to run in elections, too, but that's another story. But uh, we want to find out a little more and uh, April has agreed to come along and uh, sort of answer some questions that uh, you might have with respect to the process. Uh, everything is going electronic nowadays and I know that when I first joined CARP we used to ask folks who came out to our meetings how many were on the computer. You know we had about one or two hands that go up. and. In the last couple of years, when we ask how many people use email, how many are on the computer, we might as well turn it around and say how many aren't, because it appears that computer use amongst the uh, older generation has grown probably even more than amongst some of the other demographics, because it's a great way to keep in touch. I think in, uh, in my time here on the earth that probably two of the most I guess significant developments have been Google and the internet because you know, no, matter, no matter what you need and you know these so-called smartphones are, are getting smarter than we are of course but no matter what I ask this thing it seems to have an answer. Now whether it's not the right answer I'm not exactly sure but uh, that's why we have April here because I was afraid to ask some questions on the phone about the election process. But April agreed to come along from the city to describe uh, what taking place this year and hopefully how it's going to be easier for those of us who do have internet access and the question is going to be of course if you don't have internet access or you haven't got that little card in the mail to tell you uh, what your number is and your pin number and, and how you do all this sort of thing so uh, April you're going to explain this all to us we hope sure. yeah great for sure so just get nice and close here and uh, welcome Hi, 
thanks so much for having us here today. Um, oh, oh, that kind of close. Is this better? Okay. Um, my name's April. I'm uh, part of the commu communications team at the City of Greater Sudbury. And this down here is Danielle. Uh, Danielle works in clerk services. They are the election experts. So I brought her along with me for backup. I heard I may need it. Um, John mentioned there may be some eggs and tomatoes in the audience today. So I'm just gonna ask you to hold those to the end of the presentation along with your questions, please. So this year's election is the first uh, municipal election that's completely electronic. So this means whether voters decide to vote from their home, um, vote from a friend or family member's home, or vote at an in-person voting location set up by the city, they're gonna be doing this on an electronic device. So a computer, a tablet, or a smartphone. Because it's the first paper for this election, we understand that people will have questions and we wanna make sure that residents are comfortable with the process and that we get any of these, ans uh, these questions sorry, answered prior to the election. The election team, I can assure you, is working very hard to make sure this election is the most convenient and most accessible the municipality has ever had. Some of the steps they're taking to make sure this happens um, is they are offering information sessions, um, holding registration days, offering free transit on election day for any voters, and they're setting up voter help centers for anyone that may need assistance. All of these things are being done in the interest of making voting as easy as possible for everyone. Speak more clearly, please, so just a tad slow, more slow. I'm gonna get a little more comfortable here. Is this, no? No? How, how about now? Yeah, okay. I, I can't, I'm not strong enough. <laughs> oh, turns out I am. Here we go, how's that? This is better. Is it better for you? Can you hear me? Yes? Yeah. Okay, perfect. All right, so on your electronic ballot this year, there are three different races. Um, one of those is for mayor, and we have 11 candidates running for mayor this year. Another race is for ward councillor, so that depends on where you live in the city, it will depend on who you vote for. Um, other than in two wards where our councillors have been acclaimed. The third race is that for um, school board <coughs> trustees. Uh, the school board trustees that you'll be voting for are based on your school board support. So either English or French, separate or public. As the city, we need to remain neutral um, in election matters. Uh, we don't promote candidates or debates but we can provide you with information to contact the candidates. We have all that information on our website, um, phone numbers or websites, whatever they have provided us, we have available to you. So this year's election um, voting period is different than in the past. It lasts for an entire week. So it begins Monday, October 15th at 10 a.m. and it ends on Monday, October 22nd at 8 p.m. Monday, October 22nd is officially election day, but during that entire week, voters can cast their ballot from their own computer, tablet, or cell phone from anywhere, anytime. So this means if somebody works shift work, they don't need to try to um, organize their shifts to make it to a poll during the day. Um, it means if somebody's out of town during election week, they can vote from anywhere in the world. For voters who don't have a device to vote on or who don't have access to the internet, there will be in-person locations set up as well. On election day, there are 23 locations set up throughout the city. Um, voters are able to attend any of those locations. Uh, similar to the advanced voting period in the last election in 2014, We've adopted a vote anywhere model, which means you don't need to go to the polling station closest to your home. 
We have electronic voting locations and you can go vote at any one of those, whichever is most convenient. Leading up to election day, from October 15th to October 21st, uh, we have voter help centers set up in all of the city libraries and citizen service centers. Um, these are locations, they'll be set up um, exactly like the electronic voting locations with a privacy screen, um, but they're more of a low pressure option for people who may feel less comfortable with voting online and who may want more assistance. Voters can, sorry, voters can also bring a family member or a friend with them if they're looking for help to vote. Um, the family, there's an oath that needs to be taken and then the family member or friend can go behind the privacy screen with the voter to assist in voting. On election day, election staff will also be visiting um, long-term care homes and nursing homes um, just to ensure residents of those facilities are able to vote easily so they don't have to go out to do that. Staff at all locations have been trained and will be available to help with voting. Anyone that is not comfortable, doesn't need to be worried, we are there to help you do that. We're on to the election bus. You may have seen our election bus um, on the streets of Greater Sudbury. Uh, we hope you have. Uh, leading up again to the election, again during the voting period, um, it's going to serve as a mobile voting location. So it will be making stops from October 15th to October 20th at various locations, uh, workplaces, the market, the hospital, malls, places we know voters will be, and anyone can vote uh, at that time on the bus as well. Before anyone can uh, vote, they need to make sure they're on the voters list. So, um, our voters list, we just want to remind people, is different than the provincial voters list. So even if you voted a couple months ago, um, that does not necessarily mean that your information is updated on our municipal voters list. There's a tool currently on our website. If you go to greatersudbury.ca slash elections and you can put in your information, it will tell you instantly if you're on the voters list with the correct information. You'll also know you're on the voters list if you've received a voter information letter in the mail. Um, those have been mailed out recently. You may have already received yours. If you don't receive a voter information letter, or if you receive a letter and the information is incorrect, you can make changes currently, um, either by visiting a library or a citizen service center, or by stopping by clerk services at Tom Davies Square. All you need is a valid piece of ID to make those changes. Anyone voting in person, so if you choose to vote at a voter help center or an electronic voting location or on the bus, um, you can make those changes there as well. The voter information letter is the thing that you need to vote in this election. It includes your voter ID and your PIN number, and that's unique to each voter. Those are the credentials that you'll be using to vote. So anyone at home can use those to vote. If you're going into a voting location, you still need that paperwork to sign in to be able to cast your electronic ballot. Our city council makes decisions that impact our daily lives. They make decisions regarding um, everything from emergency services to the roads we travel on, uh, leisure services and waste collection. So we hope that you'll take the time to vote, um, to, to choose council that um, reflects your priorities in the city. We have a lot of important resources on our city website. Um, 
we have a video that demonstrates basically step to step by step the voting um, process, how exactly to cast your electronic ballot. Um, you can find voting locations by putting in your postal code. It'll tell you what locations are closest to you. Um, there's a list of acceptable IDs if you need to make changes to the, your voter information. Everything is on the website. Anyone that doesn't have access to the website should certainly call us at 311 and we'd be happy to give you that information. Um, so Danielle and I are now available for questions if anyone has questions. Um, you can also contact us afterwards if you think of something, um, always by calling 311 or by emailing election at greatersudbury.ca. So she's asking, um, the name on the voter information letter doesn't match your, is it your legal name or? Of course. Yes, okay. So it doesn't match her name. Um, so you can make those changes by bringing ID to a library, citizen service center, or um, clerk services. Um, if you keep your letter, they can make the changes and you can still vote with those same credentials. How do they make the changes? I have to use the wrong name or the you should be using your own name, your correct name to vote. So who does the change? So staff is trained to make those changes in the system. At the library? At libraries, <laughs> citizen you service centers. Do you get centers. a different PIN number? No, you won't get a different PIN number. You, uh, if, if the change is your name, all we need to do is change that in the system, and you can still use the credentials that you've received in the mail. I think, I think the problem arose because we were supposed to have some people I spoke to received a letter in July that they had to check on their registration to see if they were registered or not. I never got the letter. And apparently MPAC already uh, put everybody's name that they had information to. Uh, those names went on and mine was incorrect. So consequently, um, but I didn't know that. I, tr I called the city up and I wasn't registered at all in the city. So then I went, uh, after many trips and so on, I had to jump through a lot of hoops. I was able, to, I registered at the library with the ID that I found that was uh, appropriate that's listed on the site. And um, I got a sheet of paper with my name corrected, that, uh, you know, the correct name. And then um, I went the next day and I still, I wasn't registered to vote, but then I went again a couple of days later and I guess the system had got caught up and I was then registered according to the name, the my, my quote, real name plus the ID. So that was that. And then I got the letter with the wrong name, with the pin. <laughs> yeah, so, okay. so the issue with that is our municipal voters list is created for us. Sorry, our voters list is prepared for us by the Municipal Property Assessment Corporation. Yeah, so MPAC provides that list for us. We had information up on our election website a little earlier um, that was tied to the MPAC system to make updates in that way. We did not send any um, information out for voters. No, so it wouldn't have come from us, but it maybe MPAC was doing an enumeration <laughs> process at that time. So what happened in your instance was that there's a cutoff date in the MPAC system for when they deliver to us that preliminary list of electors. July, I think. Yeah, it's, Jul it's the end of July. So we received that preliminary list of electors at the end of July, and that information that comes over from MPAC at that time is what's used to generate the voter information letters. So what can happen sometimes is that if you made a change prior to September 1st or following, sorry, following September 1st to your name, that change may not necessarily be reflected on the letter that sorry, you received. What, 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 
that voter information letter. So when you got your voter information letter in the mail, you indicated that it had the wrong name on it, but you had gone in previously to make that change. Well, uh, I looked on the site and you weren't, you couldn't go before September the 4th to mm -hmm. make any kind of modifications yeah. to anything. Yeah, because the, so the, the Municipal Elections Act is the governing piece of legislation that sets the rules and procedures for our election. And under the Municipal Elections Act, voters are not able to make changes until September 4th, until September. Yeah, it was Yeah, so any changes made after September 1st may not have been reflected on those voter information letters because they had already been. That was, I was told, see when I called the city, mm -hmm. they didn't have me registered at all. There was no yeah. name at all. Yeah. I just wasn't registered. So unfortunately, there's there's no perfect science to the creation no, I, of I a know, voter's I just list. Yeah. It, so. yeah, so if you're on the voter's list now, you've gone in, you've followed all the proper steps, you've got your voter information letter. And I have Yes, you would have completed that EL15 form, right? It's the application to amend the voters list, so you're good to go. Okay, but the pin doesn't matter. No, it, it, the, when we make the change on the electronic side of the voters list, the change is tied to that pin number. So that pin number is tied to all of your information. So when we made the change, the pin stays the same, but the information tied to it changes to the correct information. Okay, so You got it. Thank you. So what do I have to do? Nothing? You're good to go? <laughs> yes? I have question. How well is this So the security of the system um, has been tested quite a bit. Um, internet voting is not a new method of vote. Um, it's actually been in use since 2010 for some municipalities across Ontario. So there's a multi-layer security system that's built into this. So Dominion Systems Incorporated is the provider of our electronic voting platform. And they perform all kinds of tests on the system. There's things like penetration tests to see if hackers can get into the system. They build firewalls up to uh, deny that. Sorry, I've got some other points there. So, the system is very well tested. Um, we do as well within the city of Greater Sudbury. We do, once we have the information from the provider, we also do our own internal testing of the system. Um, we create test voters and we put them through the system and we ensure that no PIN or ID can be used twice to vote or that ballots that are counted or cast in the system are reflected in the results. So Dominion itself, the company that provides this for us, they use a multi-layer security process to protect against any internal, external threats to the voting system. They have a dual data center that they house all of this election information in and through firewalls and infrastructure and downstream monitoring and prevention. They look for any suspicious traffic. So what this is too is if a lot of votes are coming in from one specific IP address or computer, things like that are flagged in the system to us as suspicious voting activity, and that's something we would follow up on. If it looks, if something looks, we have the ability to monitor the system, and if something looks a little funny and looks a bit off, we have the ability to mitigate that and go in and find out what's going on and rectify that. Great. So. Anyone has any other questions? Uh, April is going to be staying around uh, for a bit, and uh, you can ask her uh, person to person, as it were. So, can you say one quick thing? Can you say one quick one thing? thing? One more quick one thing. More this quick is very important. Thing. Uh, we're going to be set up at the back, so if anybody wants to come and see us and see if they're on the voters list, if you haven't got your card yet, or if you want to verify that your information is correct or you need to make any changes to it, we can take care of that at the back for you um, as well today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, April. Round of applause for April and, and, uh, and the other one. <laughs> what is the other one's name, by the way? Danielle. Danielle, thank you, Danielle. So it's time for our 50-50 draw. For those of you who have participated in our 50-50 draw, thank you very much. Don't forget, if you're interested in more election stuff, 
And I'm not sure if people are aware, but on October the 1st at the Sudbury Theatre Centre, uh, in between Stop and Tom, you'll have the opportunity to uh, come out and to hear all the candidates for mayor, those that are coming out. And it will be at the Sudbury Theatre Centre in the main auditorium, and there's going to be a reception afterwards. That's October the 1st at 7 o'clock. And uh, don't forget, on October the 11th, our CARP meeting for all candidates for mayor will be taking place at the Parkside Old Rattle Centre, and that will be taking place at uh, 6.30, and a little reception after that, too. And, of course, Tom Price, his presentation on October the 4th at the Lexington at uh, 2 o'clock, I believe. Tom? Tom? 1.30? Okay. Thereabouts. And so, who, we've got two different types of tickets here, so... I guess we should trust me. No, we have. You pick your own. And it's a blue ticket. And the name is. Oh, that's the other side. It's a number. We have to look at the number. Okay, number 238030. Two three eight zero three zero. We have a winner, and you are uh, going to go away happy with uh, a total of fifty eight dollars and fifty cents. Hey, fantastic! So uh, that pretty well. Uh, to, no motion to adjourn. I okay. okay, where's the door prize? No. Orange tickets, okay. We have another. Sandra, do you have a. Oh, guess what? We have an embarrassing, uh, we have an embarrassing confession to make. Keith, Sandra, do I have to come back there myself? Is anybody listening? You ever get that feeling nobody listens? I think I'm talking to my wife. box. No? Sandra? You have the door prize box? I know, but we're going to draw and then we're going to give the door prize after because we are a conscientious organization. After. We found the box. Great. Bring it on down. And then we'll, we will we will acquire the door prize afterwards. So this means you have to come back to our next meeting. You realize that? We're going to do it because you brought the box down, right? Okay. There you go. Okay. The lucky winner of for the prize. We don't know what it is, but uh, <laughs> it's great being a winner. Even <laughs> three seven. Four zero nine zero. <clears throat> Three seven four zero nine zero. Hey, congratulations, you won nothing. No, no, I <laughs> no. We will come on I I just need your name, that's all, and we'll put it on the